Once again, I'd like to welcome you to our Schools and Communities First Forum. Um, how many people here don't know Kara? Only a couple of them. That's good. That means I don't have to tell you as much about it. Um, first, I want to make sure that everybody has materials with them that were on the table, on the chairs rather. And there are more materials on the back table to grab as you go out. For those of you who may not know, CARA is a statewide organization. Um, we have CARA CATS or local regional uh, action teams in almost every region and county in the state. Um, we do advocacy, organizing, and social and political action around the state. Uh, we do a lot of work historically on Social Security, Medicare, and preserving them, protecting them, and improving them. Um, CARA is, or the California Alliance is part of the Alliance for Retired Americans, which is sort of the mother load in Washington, D.C., which is, I think, affiliated with the AFL. But we represent in California union members, union retirees, a lot of community-based organizations, individuals, and people from faith organizations. Uh, as I said, about a million. We, um, Regarding what we're about today is CARA is very interested in the Schools and Communities First Act because we helped actually gather signatures so we could put the uh, initiative on the ballot and actually qualified this year, but because we think it's going to probably get a better chance in 2020, we're putting it forward to 2020. Um, hopefully, this will be a very informative session for you and that some of you will or all of you will take it back to your organization, to your union, to your retiree group, to your church, to whoever, to your neighbors, and tell them all about it, that this is how we're gonna get funding that we lost many, many years ago with the passage of Prop 13. Um, the agenda for today is gonna to be first Ben Green from Evolve, and I hope people tell you what Evolve stands for. Uh, will come up and talk to us about the Schools and Communities First Initiative. He'll show the PowerPoint and uh, talking about it and why we should support it. Then, Jody Reed, the Director of CARA, who's in the back, signing you in from many of you know, uh, she will be asking you all to take action and have forms for you to sign to commit to getting out there and helping us organize around this issue because it's going to be a very tough fight. There are opinions already being put forward against it. Um, so without further ado, let me introduce Ben Green from Evolve who can tell you more about the communities, school and communities first legislation than I can imagine. Thank you. Good afternoon. How is everyone today? Excellent. It's great to see some friendly faces here today. Uh, my name is Ben Grief. I'm the campaign director with Evolve California. We're actually based right here in San Francisco, only a couple blocks away. Um, we focus on increasing funding for public education in California uh, because I'm sure some of you are aware we're in the bottom 10 in the nation in education funding, and that's really deplorable. And we have been working on this issue around reforming the commercial side of Prop 13 for the last six plus years. Um, because when we talk about education funding, this is something that is very linked to education funding. The idea that 40 years ago we passed a proposition that cut education funding overnight by about a third. 
So I've been really excited to be partnering with Kara um, on several presentations and working up a PowerPoint presentation to show you all here today, but also this is a presentation that we've been working on and have had other Kara members from across the state give to their local chapters and areas. So I'm really excited to be here. And I want to jump in. The most important thing here, uh, I found the picture. Excellent. So the most important thing to remember and to really talk to all of your friends, neighbors, anyone you know about this issue is focusing on what it does not do. So the Schools and Communities First Initiative, as was mentioned, will be on the November 2020 ballot, and it will reform Prop 13. Now I say reform, not repeal, because it will leave all protections in place for all residential properties. So that's any homes, any apartments, any Airbnbs, any vacation homes, any mobile homes, any residential property you can think of will be protected under Prop 13, under this initiative. Does anyone have any questions about that? All right, excellent. This is the most important thing because there's a lot of misinformation out there. The opposition has already started sending out flyers. Has anyone got anything in the mail? Okay, so we've seen some of this already, right? Trying to scare folks, right? Trying to lie to them and saying, this is going to affect your property. And that is, could not be farther from the truth. So really important to remember that. The thing about Prop 13, it was passed to protect homeowners. But ironically, it actually has benefited large commercial property owners the most. And that is because homes in California change hands roughly every 10 years. But some large commercial properties rarely have ever changed hands. And so their property taxes are never reassessed. And so we had a situation back in 1978 when Prop 13 was passed where we had a lot of commercial properties that still exist today under the same owners. Right? Whereas homes, we've had that much less frequently. About 55% of property taxes were paid by residential properties back then. And about 45 were paid by commercial properties today we can see the split is 70 to 28 percent, right? This is what we need to change. And so when I say Prop 13 to folks, well, what, what comes to mind? Let me just shout it out. Grandma. Grandma. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Anything else? Howard Jarvis. Howard Jarvis. Great. Who's familiar with Howard Jarvis? Oh, yes. oh we remember. Okay, great. Excellent. This is a great audience. He's still on his stuff that's being he, Exactly. He lives on forever with his, the Howard Jarvis Tax Affairs Association. Right. And so, so we're talking about Howard Jarvis. We talk about grandma, right? And we focus on residential property. We don't ever think about the commercial side of Prop 13, right? Because that it was never really talked about in 1978. You know, it was. The only way it was talked about was the ads that Jarvis put on where he said that all the businesses would leave if we put a tax, you know, if we didn't vote for 13 and we voted for the other proposition, there was a little more. Right, which is what we'll, we're all going to hear again next year as well. Right. But what we need to be telling people, and we need to make sure everyone is aware of it. Prop 13 is about much more than just residential property. This is the breakdown here in San Francisco of where the property tax split between commercial and residential back in, you know, prior to Prop 13 and where we are today. So you can sort of see we've had a big shift in where the property tax burden is on, right? It's, it's more and more on homeowners and less and less on commercial properties. So how is this possible? Well, like I mentioned, and I'm sure folks know here, property taxes are based on the purchase price of your property, right? So if you bought your property for $100,000 40 years ago, you're still paying 1% of that off that $100,000 price, right? And so large commercial properties, right, who rarely if ever change hands are still paying property taxes based on what their properties were worth back in the 70s. And so there's some examples of that. The biggest one is Disneyland, right? 
Who here thinks Disneyland is going to move? <laughs> no, nobody, right? They're not going to move ever. Their theme park is going to be in Anaheim till the end of time. But their property taxes also aren't going to change. Because under Prop 13, unless your property changes hands, the property taxes remain based on the purchase price. But it's not just Disneyland. Right. Even though they're one of the largest corporations in the world, there's others that are benefiting from this. Chevron. Right? Currently, Chevron is under tax by at least $100 million every single year. Right? And this is because Chevron owns oil fields, they have refineries, they own a lot of their own gas stations all across the state, they have a lot of uh, other office space. And so when you add all that up and you realize they owned that prior to 1978, they're under tax by over $100 million. And that's money that should be going back into our communities, right? Back to our schools and back to our community services that we all rely on and we all deserve. But it's not just large corporations. Who here has ever heard of Michael Dell? Dell Computers? Dell Computers, exactly, right? Michael Dell bought a hotel on, in Santa Monica for $200 million. But instead of buying the hotel himself, he split up the purchase of the hotel between his wife, himself, and a business partner. And he did this because under Prop 13, technically, if no individual or entity owns more than 50% of the property, it doesn't change hands. So he was able to avoid a hundred, or excuse me, one million dollars a year in property taxes, right? just by splitting the purchase up the way he did, so no one owns more than fifty percent, and it's not technically reassessed. Does that make sense to folks? Is, is that just him, or is that also Miramar and Susan? Um, well, yeah, th th this 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 is all him. And the the interesting part of the story is he was ready to sign. He was ready to, and his lawyer rushed in and said, "No, don't do that. Right? We could save you money." Right. And this is robbing a million dollars from LA County Schools and Public Services. And at the time that he purchased this hotel, he was the 18th richest person in the world. Right. So that is what this corporate loophole in Prop 13 is doing. It's allowing the Disneys, the Chevrons, and the Michael Dells of the world to get away with paying pennies on the dollar in property taxes, which shortchanges the rest of us. The important thing also to talk to folks about is that if we don't have large commercial property owners paying their fair share of property taxes, the rest of us pay more. Right? So California has the highest income tax rate in the country. We have the highest sales tax rate in the country. We have the second highest gas tax rate in the country. And as we all can see year after year when we go to vote, there are endless fees, parcel taxes, bond measures, everything to make ends meet. Right? Because we do not have a reliable property tax money coming in for our local governments. So the idea that Prop 13 was, is keeping our taxes low is actually fallacious. What it's done is it has shifted property tax, or it shifted the tax burden onto individuals and away from large commercial property owners. Right? And that's not what Prop 13 was about. So Schools and Communities First Initiative that's going to be on the November 2020 ballot is going to generate over $11 billion every single year back to our schools and local communities. It's going to maintain all protections for all residential properties, right? and it's also going to provide a billion dollar tax break for small businesses. Because like I mentioned, Prop 13's corporate loophole has forced local governments to nickel and dime individuals. We're going to start by taking away a very cumbersome tax for small businesses, which is the personal business property tax. Right? And so this is a tax that we're bringing in about a billion dollars every year. It's a tax that we need to, that we rely on, unfortunately. But when we have $11 billion coming in, we can stop nickel and diming our small business owners. So this is the revenue that we're talking about for the Bay Area. Right? We're talking about $3.6 billion coming in every single year. This is reliable, stable revenue from those that own large commercial properties and can afford to pay the most. Here in San Francisco, right, 
we stand to gain $836 million every single year. Now, these revenue estimates are based on 2016 land values. Next month, we will have new estimates uh, based on 2018 land values. And who here thinks that's going to go up? <laughs> right. So, this, so don't get too attached to these numbers. We're going to receive much more from this when we win in November 2020. But for now, this is sort of a baseline to give you an idea of how much money we're actually talking about here in San Francisco. So what are our opponents going to say? Right? I, I'll definitely have questions at, at the end for anyone. Um, our opponents are going to say that this is going to harm seniors. Right? Your demographic is the one that they're going to target the most right? with their lies and their scare tactics. And so you all have to be aware of what is real and what is not real. Right? And the most important thing is knowing this will not affect residential properties, this will not harm seniors. Actually, what it will do is it will help seniors. Right? Because it will provide billions and billions of dollars every single year of reliable, stable revenue to fund services that seniors and everyone else relies on and deserves. We're talking about money for first responders. Right? We're talking about money for public safety. We're talking about money for senior centers, right? for public transit, right? for paratransit services. All the things that we know or that are always under threat of being cut, right? because we don't have enough money. Right? This is reliable money that we can have to fund the things that we all care about. But it's not just about having large corporations pay their fair share or generating revenue to our schools and our local communities. It's also about evening the playing field for property owners. Right? Here we have an example down in LA. This is across the street from the Staples Center where the Lakers play. And you can see here we have two parking lots sitting side by side. Two slabs of pavement, absolutely no difference in these at all. One is paying 20 times more in property taxes than the other. Why? Well, because they purchased their property more recently than their neighbor. And so what that means is that the owner that's paying 20 times more is at a competitive disadvantage. Right? This isn't what Prop 13 was about. I mean, creating a competitive disadvantage for a, an older, more established property owner. Right? That's not what they said it was about. <laughs> Certainly not. Well, then, because this, this really wasn't what it was about. It wasn't to, to harm a, a business owner. Because this business owner that's paying 20 times more in property taxes can't charge 20 times more for parking. right? Because the price of parking is based on the market. And so this is really an important thing to talk about because this is happening all across the state where you have two properties side by side that should be paying roughly the same amount of property taxes, but aren't, purely based on when these properties were purchased. Also really important for all of us to understand that this corporate loophole in Prop 13 is very specific to California. A lot of folks don't realize. They think Prop 13 is a national thing. They think that every state has something like this. And the fact of the matter is, once Prop 13 was passed, there were a lot of copycat uh, pieces of legislation and initiatives all across the country, but none of them had this corporate loophole in Prop 13. Right? Because who would ever want to vote for that? Who would want to support this idea that the largest corporations in the world would be paying property taxes at a rate from the 1970s for the end of time, right? That doesn't make any sense. Other places have talked about doing something like this, but then they look at California, and they're like, well, that doesn't make any sense, right? You know, well, why do we want to have the highest income taxes in the country, right? Why do we want to have the highest sales tax in the country, right? Why do our schools want to be ranked in the bottom 10 in the nation in education funding? Right? And so this is very exceptional for California, right? All Schools and Communities First is working to do is to put our state on par with how basically every other place in the country taxes commercial property. So when you hear from the opposition that, oh, this is some out there idea that is coming from the progressive Bay Area, you say, no, 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 this is what Alabama does, right? This is what Texas does, right? This is what Oklahoma does. That's all we're working to do here is just put us on par with the rest of the country. Oops. So we're very excited that momentum is building for this. This has been 41 years since Prop 13 passed. Right? For 41 years, 
we've had this huge corporate loophole in Prop 13 that's cost our state $150 billion. What could we have done with that $150 billion over the last 40 years? We could have done a lot. Right? Think of all the things that, that we could have funded for that. And so now we have a huge coalition that Evolve is a member of, that CAR is a member of, hundreds of organizations across the state are behind this. And we're really excited because now is the time. Right? After 41 years, people are saying enough is enough. Right? Prop 13 was meant to protect people. This initiative will keep it in place to protect people. But large corporations aren't people. Right? And so we're very excited about all the momentum that is building around this. And I'm super excited that you all are here today to hear about this. I hope you're able to talk to other folks about this issue as well. But the number one thing, oops, remember, is that this will not change anything about Prop 13 for residential properties. And I've said this a lot, right? Some of you are like, oh, God, you've said that already. But this is so important because people don't know, right? People in this demographic, when they hear Prop 13, they automatically think, my home, right? And so that's what the other side is going to do, right? They're going to try to confuse voters. They're going to try to create a wedge between the generations, right? But we have to be smarter than that. That's why I'm here now, right? This initiative is not going to be on the ballot for another 16 months. But it's so important that we educate ourselves about this now, and we have conversations with other folks about this now, so people can very much be aware of what this will and won't do, right? This is $11 billion back to our schools and local communities that can fund a lot of things that we all care about without increasing our property taxes and without changing anything about Prop 13 for individuals or for small business owners. Jody, would you like to say a few words? Um, so um, Jody's going to uh, say a few words about how you can take action on this uh, right away, and then I will come back up and field any questions that anyone has. Great. Hi, everyone. So it's good to see all of your smiling faces, some of whom I haven't seen for a while. So it's kind of like a little reunion here, which is great. The timing is perfect because we have a lot of work to do. So as Ben said at the beginning, the opposition has already started. And some of you raised your hand saying that you've received letters starting to scare you, saying they're going to come for your property taxes next. And we've been collecting some of those. And they're very tricky. So the last batch that I've got, people actually gave me the envelope that they came in. And they're very sophisticated. So they're going through property tax files and looking for senior homeowners. And on the mailing label, you can see the lot and block number. So this is a very targeted campaign, first to senior homeowners, they merge that list with voting lists, because there's also a precinct number on this label. It's very sophisticated targeting that's happening all over the state, not just in San Francisco. And the target are seniors. Because when I talk to my kids who both just graduated high school, um, and our public school kids, um, and I'm moving on. They don't know what Prop 13 is. They weren't born when Prop 13 was passed. And they have no idea that this is what has caused their schools to struggle and that has forced them to sell candy bars and wrapping paper their entire school life. <laughs> um, and I have so much wrapping paper that I could wrap the entire Christmas for um, the state of California. I mean, and that's, that's a direct result of the fact that our schools have lost a lot of funding since this was passed, but also all of our other community services that every year during the budget fight here, right across the street, we're screaming for more money to go into home care, to paratransit, to public transit, and we're, you know, robbing from one pot to pay for another just to keep the public services that we depend upon funded. So our folks are the ones who are going to get 
hit over and over by the opposition, scaring you into thinking that they're coming for your property taxes next. So part of the reason we're starting this so early is that we need to talk to everybody. And that's where we need your help. So you all should have gotten at your seat some materials, which include lots of stuff, frequently asked questions, which we're going to go over in a bit. But this green card, uh, this green card is really should have been printed in gold, because this is gold to us. Um, what we are asking folks to do is to help us take this presentation everywhere we can. So if you go to, if you have a book club, if you go to a group at your religious congregation, if your union retiree group meets, if your senior building um, has programs every now and then, if your senior center has programs, anywhere you go where you can gather a group of people, you can even invite your neighbors to come to your house for coffee and for a presentation. We'll go anywhere. Um, and we need to go anywhere because I kind of see you all as the choir. You came because you know about this, you maybe had a few questions, but you're interested in learning a little more and getting your talking points together so that you could be a better ambassador for this um, measure. Um, but we need to get to the next level beyond because those are the folks who are not getting information as rare as frequently as you are who are going to base decisions on things like the mail that's going to be non-stop TV advertising there's a lot of money to as you can see that they've been hoarding for 41 years to spend to oppose this measure and so our best ammunition is you so what we're asking you to do is think about where you go, where you might be willing to help us set up a presentation so that we can, big or small, it doesn't have to be a room like this, it can be like I said in somebody's living room. Um, if you feel like you want to be involved more, um, more specifically in the campaign, there are other things you can do. You can be trained to do this presentation. And we have a lot of different ways you can do this. So as I say all the time, and you all know me, I'm not a very tech savvy person. Um, fortunately, I had an assistant helping set this up today. But a lot of people don't have a PowerPoint and a computer um, and an LCD projector to do this presentation. We, there's lots of other ways to do it. We can do it with real hard copies of these slides. And you can just bring copies and take people through it. There's a lot of ways to talk about this. We're going to do trainings uh, around the state, and some of them you will be able to do by teleconference, so you don't even have to get out of your pajamas to be trained. But we're going to need people who are willing to be a voice for this measure, who will take your suggestions of locations, and once we've established appointments, send some of our ambassadors out to talk about this. There is no better spokesperson for on this issue to seniors in particular than other seniors <coughs> who understand the importance of protecting their own residential property taxes because without that protection we might all be out of this city for those of us who are homeowners and that's true all across the state so but also you all remember when we voted for this you're the you're the voting population that voted for this protection. And you're also the population that has seen what has happened as a result of this to our schools and to our communities. And so there is no better spokesperson to talk to other seniors than you. So we're asking you if that's something you are willing to try to mark on this card that you're willing to be trained as a speaker. And then finally, um, we have this petition to Governor Newsom that's in your packet. The Democratic Party at, uh, for California at their convention and whenever that was the end of May did vote to make this initiative, this proposal, a priority. But we need to make sure that all the elected officials talk about this, talk about their support for this, and most importantly, our governor. So that this is part of the talking points of how we take back our state how we infuse our local communities with more money. So there is a petition 
that is also kind of an excuse to talk to other people. So if you can take your petition and talk to your neighbors, your friends, your book club members, wherever you go, it gives you an opportunity to talk about the importance of this, to start getting people thinking and hearing the words schools and communities first, and to engage in a conversation. So besides the materials that you have at your chair, or if you didn't sit at a chair that had one, they're all over the place here, and we're going to have to pick them up, so you might as well take a bunch. Um, and you can get started right today. We have more in the back. But what we want you to leave with us is the green card, because this is how we're going to get to the next level of folks in San Francisco. How many of you are a member of an organization, or a faith-based community, or a book club, or something? Raise your hand if you belong to at least one thing. So all of you have the possibility of helping us set up a presentation like this at your group. All, almost all of you raise your hand. Think about those, write them down, and help us spread the word. If you know people in other counties, you have family in other parts of the state, we're going to be doing the same thing all over the state of California. So you might want to let us know about somebody who might be interested in Fresno or Rialto or San Diego or wherever. So leave these on the table where you signed in and we will collate them, we'll make a list of who's willing to go where, and we'll start contacting you in the next few months to ask for your help to set up these appointments, and for those who are willing to be a trainer and a presenter, to schedule a training that you can participate in so you're, you've got all the facts and figures and materials that you need to do what Ben just did today. So I'm going to leave it at that and bring Ben back up and we're going to give you all now a chance to ask any question you have about the initiative or what we're asking you to do. So owners pay taxes? Yes. yes. That's a great, or a great target for us to counter the um, opposition to this proposition. Yeah. Uh, because yes. there are lots of them as opposed to one. I think of neighborhoods with, with individual houses. Every, every member in a condo unit um, is paying taxes, and we ought to figure out how to get th their associations on board with us. I think that's a great idea, right? And that, that's why it's so great to be here now and start to brainstorm who, who are or where are these organizations that we can actually get to. I think Condo Association is fantastic. So some of our neighborhoods, you know, had a lot of monolingual um, speakers of other languages, and I find it that Sometimes these people are very targeted for this type of yeah. thing, this information. So, um, are these materials available in other languages? And um, the other thing is, um, you uh, planning on also doing these presentations in other languages? The, the idea is, you know, we can create all the materials that we need whatever language we need. We just need folks to be out there in the communities who are able to make these presentations. So two questions if I may one. Um, if you could say something about the danger of uh, passing for renters and the protection in the in it about that. And then second, my eyesight's not that great. I see a couple of unions, SEIU and um, California teachers um, up there as part of what's going on with the rest of the unions. I can answer part of that. So, as you know, Cara Renfa, our, our home is in the office of the California Labor Federation, which is the network of unions um, around the state. And although many individual unions, particularly public employee unions, because this will benefit public services, have taken, are starting to take positions like SEIU has, a lot of the school unions. Uh, but the Labor Fed has this process for taking positions and we just, we've been bugging them because we want them to get out in front. And so in December is when they're going to do their COPE meeting. For those of you who are familiar with labor and their process, that is when they're going to officially take positions both on candidates and on this measure. 
so that at least they'll have you know a full 10 months or more to be able to then inform and engage their own member unions in this fight but they need to go through this process that they've got set up so even though i think it's pretty likely that they're going to endorse this they have to go through their procedure so december i don't remember the date but that if, if you're in a labor union you can talk with them about the upcoming COPE meeting for the Labor Federation and help make sure that they endorse this. The much longer list of hundreds of organizations, and some of them are labor as well, that have endorsed this. Um, and we expect really to have all organizations that are left of center to be endorsing this by the time this is, uh, you know, really becomes a statewide campaign. Uh, because at the end of the day, it's like, who's Saturday you want? You know? Um, the, the question about the rents, a really good statistic to know about this is of the $11 billion that this will generate, nearly 80% of that comes from just 8% of commercial properties. So think about that for a moment, right? 80% of the $11 million is coming from just 8% of commercial properties. That's because a lot of commercial properties have changed hands, right? They are new. You know, here in the Bay Area, we sort of understand, okay, all the land that Google's buying up in San Jose right now, they're paying fair market value and property taxes. Apple's second campus, fair market value and property taxes. Facebook's campus in Menlo Park, fair market value. Salesforce Tower, all of the new building that we have here is paying fair market value. It's only a small number of large commercial properties that have actually had their properties for three or four decades that are getting away with not paying their fair share, and that's where the lion's share of the money is coming from. So it, it's really important to know this will not affect all commercial properties or all businesses, certainly in the same way. Um, the, the other thing is if commercial property owners, if the if landlords are benefiting from this, they're certainly not passing on those tax savings to anyone renting a property, right? This is something where, <coughs> The rents are based on the market, not based on the property taxes that a commercial property owner will pay. Similarly to the Staples Center example, right? The price of parking is based on the market, not what each individual parking lot owner pays. So it's an important thing to note about this, where this idea that, first of all, this is going to make all businesses flee is totally wrong. Right? Because as we just said, it's, it's only affecting a small number right, in this way. And the second thing is the idea that somehow this is keeping our prices for goods and services or rents down is also wrong. Right? There's so many examples of gas stations across some street from another. One is a Chevron that's paying 40 years old property taxes. The other one is another company that's paying more modern day property taxes. The price of gas does not correlate. To that. A lot of times Chevron's more expensive, even though they're saving on property taxes. Uh, you have Trader Joe's or Safeway or Whole Foods. There's hundreds of those all around the Bay Area. The price of milk is not dependent on what property taxes that they're paying. So really important to remember this, because the other side is going to say, oh, well, this is the price of gas is just going to go up. Not true. The price of gas is dictated by a lot of other factors that are out of California's control. Right? What's going on in the Middle East? What's happening with OPEC? What's going on with the other 17 coal producing states? The price of gas is not based on the property taxes that Chevron is paying in California. Here, sorry, pardon me. Yeah, is, are there controls in place saying where this money is going to go? Because I remember when, we, when they were hyping having um, you know, a lottery, we were told that all that money would go to the schools, the schools would be in great ah! And all of a sudden, it all disappeared, and I wondered what happened. And then I found out that they lowered the school appropriations and used the stuff for all other kinds of things. So are there any controls in place about where the money goes to the community and how it's used? I mean, we have heard forever, right? And even before we were advocating for changing uh, Prop 13, and we were just talking about education funding in general, people would say, well, what about the lottery? So I think the, the first thing about the lottery is it brings in about a billion dollars every year, right? Of one billion, right? Um, and we have about a $70 billion education budget. So I think it's important to also talk to your friends and your neighbors and colleagues and say, the lottery is not providing 
a lot of money for schools as it is. Because that is something that, I don't, I don't remember that, I was not here in California then, but they did such a great job of telling voters that this is going to save our schools, right? And, it, you know, and here we are today where it's only a billion dollars, right? Um, half of the money is going to go to local governments, right? That's to our cities, that's to our counties, that's to our special districts, right? It's a little bit different, obviously, San Francisco is a city and county, uh, but when we're talking about special districts, we talk about water districts or fire districts, right? When we talk about climate change and all the fires that that's bringing about, we are not prepared to combat that because we do not have the fire protection that we used to have. In East Contra across the county, there were eight fire districts in 2004. Today, there's only three. And they, every, they have tried three separate times for a parcel tax, but that has not passed. And so this is the type of thing that this corporate loophole and Prop 13 has done. Right? It has defunded our public safety. So half the money to local governments, and half will be going to our schools. Is the campaign going to address the issue of Proposition 13 and redlining? In other words, how are we going to reach out to communities that have been redlined? This, the reassessment of large commercial properties, right, to generate billions of dollars of reliable revenue for our schools and public services, and that is really the only thing that we're going to be addressing in this. We, we don't want to take on too much, Right? We certainly don't want to talk about the residential side of Prop 13 because a lot of people like that, and as Jody mentioned, it's keeping a lot of you know, seniors in their homes. This is just focused on these large commercial property owners. I live in a masterpiece SRO hotel, which is for seniors. How will this all affect them? Um, it will not be affected. Great question. The school, does that include Community colleges. Uh, yes, I'm talking not really about community colleges, right? And and how their funding was decimated, right? That's so important. And the community colleges stand to gain about or like over six hundred million dollars every single year, and that's real money for for a community college campus. How do we tell small businesses who are renters that they're going to be okay, that they're going to survive, that there is something in this for them? Small businesses, we're going to eliminate this personal business property tax. That's about a billion dollar tax rate for small businesses. Um, the other thing about small businesses is Prop 13's corporate loophole has actually hurt small businesses mm -hmm. by incentivizing local governments to establish big box stores. Right? If you think about Emeryville, right? Emeryville is all big box stores. Right? And that doesn't help the small businesses in Oakland at all. But they're all big box stores because that's where the revenue is. Right? If you need revenue and you can't get property tax money like you used to, where can a local government get revenue from? Sales tax. Right? And that's what we've been doing is we've been chasing the sales tax. So we don't have as much space for housing because we've had more commercial property being developed because we desperately need this money to make ends meet. And so that's something that's really important to remember, along with the tax break for uh, small business owners. And then the other thing is, who sees vacant storefronts around, right? So the idea that commercial property owners, and again, some commercial property owners, because most are at or near market value, right? But, but that some commercial property owners are all of a sudden going to have to pay fair market value on property taxes and then double the rent. That's just not something that's sustainable for them because there's already enough small businesses that can't afford the rent, right? So they need to rent out their space, right? So that's why it's based on the market. Whatever the market will bear is what the rents will be. Again, it's not correlated to the property taxes. If that were the case, then everyone would be trying to get into the Prop 13 protected commercial spaces. But that's not something. This isn't like rent control, right? Well, it's a rent control building. Let me try to get in there. There's no such thing for commercial property because commercial property owners are not passing that savings down. Prop 13 provided that seniors could opt out of school tax. Now, uh, when I owned property, I didn't opt out because I think schools are important, not only for my children, but my grandchildren and other people's grandchildren. But there are seniors who opt out. Will this new thing 
eliminate it. No. The reason I question that is that many seniors will feel that or think that this changes and they may have to pay school tax. But I think that's a very important fact to say. Everything stays it has, and, and these are the only changes. Mm -hmm. Yes. Uh, that, that, I, I think that, that's exactly right, right? Homeowner privileges, apartment owner privileges, senior privileges, they all remain in place. This is just for the large commercial property owners. So that property owners and commercial ones are going to have a pile of money to scare people with. The sugary tax beverage was a, a recent, just tiny example. So I'm hoping there will be ads, simple and targeted, at seniors and other property owners to let them know what's going on to diffuse the lies because that's how they win. Secondly, yes, the seniors are the first generation to have gotten relief from Prop 13. Millennials, many of them were born into houses that were had relief from Prop 13 and don't know what, uh, what it was like for their parents beforehand. So I think we need to be targeting millennials as well. They also were the generation in 2000 to 2008 that got hit with the mortgage meltdown, and they were jumping into home buying for the first time and have no idea of the history. So anything we can do to teach them, that would be helpful. We need to talk to millennials about this, mm -hmm. right? And if, if they're frustrated about things, they should really take a look at the corporate loop on Prop 13 and, and where we are. Um, your other point it, to make like simple, clear ads to seniors, 100%. We know that this is going to be the most expensive ballot measure in the history of the country. Right? They have already pledged at least $100 million. They're going to spend more. Right? And you, you, you will see, I apologize. Uh, all the mail that you're going to see, all the TV ads, all the radio ads you're going to see, they're going to do everything that they can to scare folks, which is, again, why we're here. Right, and why we're working, why Gaval was working with Car, why Joey was just talking about, it's like we need to get the message out now. So, great points. So, um, a question, uh, two questions actually. One is, it, this uh, uh, ballot measure is drafted? Yeah, so this is already qualified for the $20 million. You can find it online then. And yes. Read it, read it in brief. You keep saying large commercial property. Um, what defines a large commercial property? For purposes of this legislation, yeah, no. great. The small business owners and owner of property under two million dollars. Under two million dollars. Yes. Retail establishment or neighbor commercial district in San Francisco would be subject to reassessment under this. You know, commercial property is a lot less valuable than residential property. So we all know the cost of housing in these states, and we'd be like, oh wow, you, know, you can't buy a house for less than two million dollars. Commercial property is actually different, uh, but it, it's interesting that we had a comparison of gas stations that we're going to have to, you know, one was going to have to pay their fair share versus the other. Um, and then we realized the other one was less than $2 million, so that it will still be protected by this. So it, it is different to look at commercial property values versus residential property values. The question is, what does evolve mean? I was out of the room for a minute to make you said that. The second one is that I can point out that, again, maybe this was mentioned while I was out of the room, but a set of people are being held hostage by Proposition 13. That includes seniors who would like to move, but can't because they feel like they would like to move to a different place and they feel they would lose their benefits. And then younger people who, again, they bought in one place and their job would like to move them somewhere else and they would like to move somewhere else, but they feel they couldn't afford to move somewhere else. So um, this would end up helping Two, set, two demographics, older and younger. And, and I think that is something that we need to keep in mind. Uh, uh, well, the, the, the idea behind it is that we need to evolve our state. Right? We, aren't, we aren't radical revolutionaries right? that want to tear it all down. We just think we need to evolve. So it works perfectly with this issue. Right? We're not repealing Prop 13. We're not getting rid of Prop 13. We're just updating it. We're evolving Prop 13 for what we have today. Uh, my union, for example, owns a piece of property here in San Francisco. Would that be considered a commercial property if it were to be, would it be reassessed? Um, yes. So if we're not changing any of the existing laws around what properties currently don't pay property taxes, like hospitals and churches and other things like that, and certain nonprofits. 
but but with, 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 with some um, that do currently pay property taxes, and if their property was over two million dollars, they would be reassessed. Yes. Let me ask one more follow-up. What about uh, residential housing for seniors? Does anyone want to answer that? Exactly. Nothing changes. Excellent. Most important thing: nothing changes for any residential property. Very, very important to know. You know, when people move, if they move to certain places, they take their their property tax there, and other people, it just disappears, and they have to start all over again. Did you answer that? You, you know, this again will not change anything for residential properties. This is only be for commercial properties. So, so that it'll stay the same, and we have to stay in that house. Forever. No, no. So there are uh, in San Francisco, and you're currently a homeowner in San Francisco. You keep your current property tax base. This is this was a law, and there was some reciprocity across county lines as well. Not every county, but like if we wanted to move to Alameda County, and you owned a home in San Francisco County, you could keep your current so property tax. That stays right, the same. That stays the same. Nothing will change about that. That's right. I just wanted to know, um, I assume that it's just to gather names of people that hopefully will support it when we come to the election, but I was wondering if it's an open petition that when we send it in to Cara, it says down here, let's send it to Cara, um, every so often we'll send it in to the governor, or how is that going to be done? Yeah, yeah, we, and, and, and Joey mentioned, you know, the, the California Democratic Party formally endorsed the initiative. We're getting more and more folks in the legislature to endorse. Um, but we really need the governor. And so the only thing we can do is to show him that this is something that the people of California want. So the petitions are very important. In fact, you talked about Facebook, Google, and Salesforce, and how and why they are exempt. Uh, there are a number of uh, commercial properties. They're currently paying fair market value, so they're not going to be That are currently not exempt. They're, they're getting the, the, the loophole. I'm hoping you talked about the uh, the uh, Dells in San Francisco and locally, people are going to be talking to who are we talking about? Hopefully, they'll do some kind of evaluation there, or like the uh, properties around Staples of instances of that kind of disparity here. That's number one. Uh, number two is I didn't hear the response to Ed's question about the pass through and the inability of landlords of commercial or commercial landlord properties passing it on if they do uh, it. Maybe I missed it, maybe it's because it's residential, not even involved, but if it's somehow commercial and residential or something falls in that dual category. Sure, so, so the, this is actually a great point that I didn't mention this earlier. If you have residential property on the top in a mixed use building, right, and then you have the retail on the bottom, the retail on the bottom, that floor, that would be reassessed, but all the residential floors on top would not be reassessed. David, thank you for mentioning that. Um, we just got some um, new data in, um, so we're having our researchers look for more examples, specifically for San Francisco County. Um, but do folks know Shorenstein? Yeah. Yes. So, do we know that the Twitter building down here on 10th and, and Market? That's a perfect example, right? And there was a story about that a year or so ago where the Shorenstein company did the same thing that Dell did and split up their property. They bought that property for like $900 million, mm -hmm. right? And they're charging market rent to Twitter, right? But they were able to split it up and not pay market value for property taxes. That is the type of thing that we're going to change uh, when we pass this in November 2020. Um, so I'm going to come back around. I, uh, for those properties that bought um, more recently and are paying fair market, um, what they're paying property taxes at their current assessed rate, well, this proposal, um, then they could continue at that rate for another four years. But this proposal actually uh, states that there will be regular reassessments of commercial and industrial property. And maybe you can explain. Um, how often that will happen, so that we don't wind up back in the situation again four years down the line. The initiative leaves the reassessment period up to the legislature, and it can be up to one, two, or three years. Oh, right? Yeah. Right. So, so, so it, we were assuming that it will be every three years, um, and that's for all 
commercial trial review moving forward, so we don't have to do this again in 41 years. Okay. Another thing the uh, opposition might use, and it's kind of alluded to in uh, questions before mine, but what about places like Safeway? Large commercial property, and they will say the prices of your food is going to go up because of this, and that's going to scare a lot of working class people. Right. What I tell people is right now every Safeway is paying a different property tax or they're leasing space from a property owner that's paying a different property tax than another Safeway that's leasing space and that has absolutely no bearing on the price of milk. It's all the same. And, and we've done it. We've looked at the prices of, of these things and it's completely the same because the, the, the price of milk is dependent on the market. I think it's also really important to know that unless you, you are in the business of parking lots, Right? or your commercial developer, your biggest line item on your budget is not the property tax. That's right. right? And that, that's really important to know. If, if anyone is a small business owner or sort of thinks about owning a business or you know, what their employer, what their biggest line item was, it's salaries. That's right. right? It's health care. Right? It's payroll taxes. It's, it's, it's all the other things that go towards running a business. It's not the property tax, right? especially for some of the big corporations like Safeway. How many of you remember when Bond's drugs used to exist? Yeah. Well, they no longer do when they sold all their properties to CVS. And there were over 400 of them yep. around the state of California. And part of the sweetheart deal that they made was that they didn't change more than 49% of the ownership on the deed, so CVS as a new business never paid any new property tax rates or increased their property tax assessment when that sale occurred. But has CVS lowered their merchandise no. for it to you because they're paying less than maybe a new Walgreens down the street that just opened up, which is paying a higher property tax rate because they purchased more recently. So again, I think it just shows you that you know the businesses are going to charge what they can get away with for the for the services and merchandise that they sell. And if they're way over the price of their neighboring pharmacy, in this case. They're going to start seeing less business and less return customers. So that property taxes have absolutely nothing to do with them lowering their the cost of their merchandise when they've benefited from this, nor raising it because no one will shop there if they cost more than the other competing market across the street. Are we still paying the same price to get to Disneyland as we were 41 years ago? No. No. Right? Have their ticket prices gone up? Do we know how much? A very specific amount. It's gone up like 1,028%. Why so specific? Because they have ostensibly some very smart individuals that are working to figure out what is the exact price point that they can get enough people to get in through the gates without turning people away. Right? The, 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 all the prices are based on the market and what the market will bear, not on the property tax that Disney is paying. And that's what all businesses do. They figure out exactly the price that's going to get enough of us to buy their product, not based on anything else. Bigger businesses try to divide up the ownership to stay under 50%. And the point is that when they sell, when one of those partners sells, that's how they keep their tax break, their current tax break. So when you're explaining it to people, that's part of what you need to say is that they split it up so that they can sell a part of the business to somebody else and still pay the same property tax. Right. Me, Joey, and Hey are going to go on a home and split it up and have the property taxes not be reassessed. Right. This is something only for the commercial property owners and the wealthiest people in the world like Michael Dell. Yeah. I am a huge proponent proponent of low dollar grassroots monthly donations. And I know seniors are often can't afford big donations. If you could start a monthly donor program now geared to seniors and let that build up, that will help increase the pot of money.
It, it, it really makes a big difference because you, you get a lot of people involved. It's a lot of money. Uh, so I wanted to mention another issue that is not that is would be a consequence of the passage of um, you know, not yet, of proper team reform. Mm -hmm. um, and this is not your problem. It's not our problem as advocates for this ballot measure. But when it passes, county assessors are going to have to start appraising commercial property at market rate. And they're going to have to hire a lot more appraisers. And so we're, um, uh, through our political committee in uh, Alameda County, we're already talking to the members of the county board of supervisors and saying, you got to start putting more money in your budget uh, because the, uh, the county assessor who's only been on the job six months is already uh, screaming, kicking the screaming. Uh, but that's not for now. That's in the future, but that's those of us who are involved in public sector unions, uh, that'll be on plate. Yeah, I know there are some assessors across the state that have already started planning for this. That are like, oh, we don't want to be caught flat-footed. We want to hire people to do more good-paying jobs, which you know we're excited about. Um, there are some assessors, though, that are not excited about this. Because it's going to be more work. Yeah. Right? And if you've been doing your job for 40 years one way, and then all of a sudden your boss comes and says, you got to start doing this, they're not going to want to do it. So I understand that from the assessor's point of view. But you have to understand, this is what they do everywhere else. Right? So if New York can do it, if Chicago can do it, if Houston and Dallas can do it, then I think we can do it in Oakland. I think we can do it in San Francisco. Right? On that point, we're not changing the rate that commercial property owners are going to have to pay. We're still at 1%, but it's going to change it to the market value. Right? Other places charge more for commercial property than they do residential. We have a flip here, right, where more of us are paying property taxes in terms of like that 72-28 um, graphic. New York is 4%, Detroit is 4%, right? Houston is like 3.5%. Because if you own commercial property, you can afford to pay taxes for your schools and local services, right? That's the way everyone else does it. Here we have it completely backwards. We're not even going there, though. That's, that's the thing. We're not even trying to change the rate. This is not a tax increase. This is simply changing how often properties are reassessed in California. We want to have the oldest properties reassessed first. We're really focused on that 80%, right? The smallest properties will be reassessed last. So we have a phase-in mechanism where it's like, just focus on the big properties that I'm going to pay their fair share for three or four decades, and then we can get to the smaller properties. This is going to be a 50 plus one simple majority to win. Right? This isn't going to be a two-thirds super majority. It's not a tax increase. Once we pass this thing, what are these large companies going to do to get it undone? And how long will they hold it up in the courts do we have any idea years or whatever? Oh. You, you know how things go. You pass something and then they come back and they try to get rid of it later on. We'll see if they have the stomach for that. Um, I think things are changing in California. Right? We have huge demographic shifts. We're more blue than ever before. We're a lot different than we were 41 years ago when Howard Jarvis was around. Right? Com completely different uh, political. Politically, we're just moving in a different direction. So if, if we are able to pass this, which I believe we will, I think it would be very difficult then for them to run a campaign against um, the, the following election cycle. Um, the, the last thing I would say is thank you all for being here. Thank you all for your great questions. It's, it's been fantastic to see people here that are excited about this, are interested about in this, and willing to go and talk to other folks about it. Um, this will be the second most important thing on the ballot in 2020. We know what the first most important thing is going to be, but then this will have ramifications for us, right? And this is going to make our communities better, right? It's going to make everything better in California. It's going to make things more fair, but it's more than just that, right? This is going to have national ramifications. When Prop 13 passed in 1978, Ronald Reagan wrote his biography that this set off a prairie fire of an anti-tax rule. There were 43 other states that passed anti-tax measures right after this. We set the stage for what we have today. Right? This is what Howard Jarvis did. We have an enormous opportunity right now, and now more important than ever, to actually roll that back.
to show that we can be the progressive leader again, to show that we can say, yes, we are the blue alternative to what is going on in other parts of the country. But until we change this, right, and until we make it so we are spending more per student than Alabama, it's really hard for us to really stand on it. Thank you all very much for the Working folk of this country will rise.